The series begins in Antwerp as Luke Brunner burns a dumpster and heads out, communicating with Barry in comms, who helps him infiltrate the fire brigade and head into the Diamond District. All of this is a ruse, given Luke's real objective is to slip underground and break into the vault from below. The objective here is to break out a bunch of diamonds, which Luke takes and manages to hightail it out of there without being spotted. This whole diamond gig is actually a ruse to bring in a top diamond seller and figure out who his boss is. While Barry organizes a strike from afar, it becomes clear that Luke Bruner is actually a CIA agent. He makes it out the base in one piece, completing his final mission and finally retiring from the CIA, with plans to return to the U.S. as a hero and a retired agent. We then cut forward to New York, where Luke returns home with a gift for Emma, which happens to be a KitchenAid. He also has a gift for his granddaughter, Romy, whom he gives one of the stolen Congolese warlord's diamonds, which he kept hold of. Barry is not happy, pointing out that this is evidence. There's a recurring joke about an ice cream cake in the middle of this, which is pretty funny, but it's thrown into the midst of an awkward family situation. Luke is divorced, and he seems to be a bit of a loner, and without Tally by his side, he believes that a ticket over to a big ship is just the ticket to get her back. Before he can return, though, Barry is in with big news. They're about to lose one of their operatives who has a code name of Panda. She's been in Guyana for a while and is seemingly wrapped up with Omar Polonia's son, who has decided to pick up his father's mantle and now has over 400 members helping to distribute illegal arms. Oh, and he also has a suitcase nuke, too. Boro is the man's name, and he intends to hold an auction, where all the biggest and baddest criminals are going to converge and try to get the weapon. Unfortunately, Troy, Boro's right-hand man, has figured out Panda is a planted agent, and given they've lost communication, they have 36 hours until Troy is back in Guyana and exposes Panda. They need someone Boro trusts, and that calls for Finn Hoss. Finn happens to be Luke's codename, and given the orders have come from HQ, he's torn over wanting to try and patch things up with Tally, but she's already dating a guy from work called Donnie, which Luke is not happy about. In Guyana, Luke meets Kane, Boro's first lieutenant. He's pretty distrusting of him, but after patting him down, he shows up in Boro's camp. After being shown around, Luke is shocked to find Danielle DeRosa in the ring fighting for money. Danny is actually his daughter Emma, and she's right in the thick of all this. Emma shows her skills in the ring, as it becomes clear that she's actually Panda, part of the CIA, and apparently she has the strongest skills. Her recall, problem-solving skills, and IQ are completely off the charts. She was born to do this and took the job after college. Three years they've been in this, and the CIA created a Chinese wall to keep her and her father separate. Luke is not happy that his daughter has been lying, and while she walks away, there are bigger problems afoot. They have until 4 a.m. before Troy lands and need to try and resolve this issue before it's too late. In the privacy of the woods after Boro's departure, Luke confronted Barry over the phone, demanding to know why he hadn't disclosed that Emma was a CIA operative. Barry explained that he had intentionally kept that information from Luke to prevent him from losing focus on his mission. Meanwhile, Luke caught up with his daughter Emma and urged her to prepare for their mission to eliminate Troy. Following the party, Luke and Emma embark on their mission to kill Troy, and they successfully get rid of Troy and the others associated with him and Boro. At the airstrip, Emma and Luke end up arguing and don't realize that they completely run over their guy down there. We then cut across to the next morning, where Emma points out that she's the best shot in the compound. Emma is furious at Luke for being responsible for the divorce and claims that her situation is not the same, given she's perfect at everything and doesn't have a family. Luke tries to make amends, but they end up coming unstuck when the bodies Emma decides to dump down at the rice paddies wash upstream. The vertical slit on their throat is identical to Luke's trademark, and their cover is blown. Luke and Emma manage to grab the nuke suitcase after faking an accelerated countdown, and with Will and his family grabbing a ride, they head down to the airstrip together. However, they're surrounded by Boro and his men at the last, while Barry is nowhere to be found. Boro and his men show up and demand to know who Luke and Emma are working with. With William's daughter threatened with a gun, Luke buys them precious time by discussing Boro's father's last moments. A helicopter flies overhead, with bullets raining down on the foes. However, Boro manages to get away unscathed. 
24 hours later, CIA Director Dot decides that Emma and Luke are going to have to work together for the future case to bring in Boro, given they've both been working on this. Dot points out that Emma's hot-headed nature and cockiness could have resulted in officers being killed. Remember Panda's comms going down? Well, Dot tells Luke in confidence that Emma actually chose to turn it off herself, given she was close to getting the nuke back. Emma and Luke naturally come to blows, with the former telling her father not to screw up this case like he screwed up their family. The group soon learn that Boro is still alive after trying to fake his death, and appears to be en route to somewhere in Eastern Europe or Asia. His auction is still on, so it seems like he's going to create another nuke briefcase. The group later learn that Boro is off in Kazakhstan, where he intends to move a tanker worth of cesium-137, which is being transported in a maglev train. The only play is to try and stop the train, suck the waste into a tanker truck, and take off. Everyone is heading in undercover. 9 p.m. hits and the group prepare to head out. Before the choke point, Luke jumps in all guns blazing when a helicopter arrives and begins to take the Celsium-137 from the air. Luke and Emma decide to speed up the train in order to stop Boro, who's in a helicopter above. Unfortunately, Barry ends up miscommunicating with him. This misunderstanding leads Luke to speed up the train way too much, with the pair en route to disaster. Emma deciding to warm up the magnets with nuclear sludge. Luke decides to use their magnetic suits to help, the ones from their therapy session last chapter. With both Luke and Emma on either side of the carriage, they finally listen to one another and work together to bring the hose in and warm the magnets. It works to slow the train down, and they breathe a sigh of relief. A story about a Moldovan scientist being kidnapped shows up just then, and that seems to be their next play. The Moldovan applied physicist is called Dr. Carl Novak, and he was in Ireland on a goodwill plan. He actually authored a paper on how to extract and augment fissile nuclear material from nuclear waste. They don't have much to go on, but it does play into Boro's hands, given this is what he's after. Similarly, Alden is put into play as the Pooh Bear of this operation, serving as the honeypot to trap Nika Stalinovich, a mid-level manager with low self-esteem who also happens to have Novak's files on her computer. As fate would have it, it turns out it's not Nika after all, but actually Nick A. As a result, Alden is out, and Emma will need to be put in place, especially as he's not gay. So Emma heads in to do her best, with Alden watching on. In the truck happens to be Rue and Luke, who work out where his house is. As they get into place, Emma is invited back to Nick's place. Tina and Barry work to get rid of the Faraday cage that limits comms inside the building, but there's an awkward moment when Emma drops her phone while kissing Nick. He picks it up and notices the mobile game, the same one used to decrypt the data from Nick's laptop. It's touch and go for a while, as Luke manages to fix the connection, and the group download the data. Emma goes all in with her honeypotting as they take things into the bedroom where she severs her communication with the group and proceeds to start spanking Nick, given that's one of his fetishes. Emma finds the safe and breaks in, taking the hard copy of the research papers. A click of a gun prompts her to turn slowly, though, as Nick wakes up and points a gun at her. Emma is held up at gunpoint. Luke realizes this plan is compromised and charges in through the front to save her. Back inside, Emma talks her way out of this situation with ease, explaining to Nick that he could be killed if he grasses her out. So thankfully, the group managed to get out without arousing suspicions, especially when the police decide that this is all just a robbery gone wrong. Emma explains that she loves her job, but realizes she can't be with Carter and do this at the same time, it's just too much. However, any chance of a breakup comes crashing down around them when Carter delivers a lavish gesture just for her, which includes a big violin and a proposal involving a violin string ring. Put on the spot with both Luke and Tally watching, Emma decides to say yes. Luke is not happy, though. Meanwhile, Boro questions Dr. Carl Novak over what he needs to make his nuke briefcase. Well, it comes in the form of an MNR, miniature nuclear reactor, which should put Boro's plan in place sooner rather than later. The meeting reconvenes where Dot gets the group up to scratch on the MNR again, something that Boro is trying to bring into the fold. They decide to use this to their advantage, deciding to use bait to lure Boro in and catch him. And the person they need for this? The Great Dane. Unfortunately, 
He's in a Turkish prison under an assumed name and he's only two years into a four-year stint so they have to break him out. Oh, and Rue has no love lost for him either, given she's missing a toe, courtesy of a shooting accident gone wrong. The only way to make this successful is to come from someone going into the prison to take his place. Barry volunteers, intending to impress Tina, and Rue even puts in a good word for him too. While Barry manages to settle into life behind bars, managing to talk to Tina on a private channel, the Dane is saved thanks to a bit of the Dark Knight breakout play, using a balloon and hooking it onto the plane to fly away. Back inside, Barry manages to get closer to Tina, admitting he did all of this to impress her. On the plane, the Great Dane agrees to be part of this deal, especially as it means he has shall be a free man afterwards. Dane sorts out a meeting with Boro, and he agrees to be in touch with a location for them. Outside, though, Luke and Emma come to blows again as she learns about his meeting on the ship with Carter. While they argue, they take their eyes off the ball and their truck is stolen. With things getting more complicated by the minute, Boro agrees to meet in the next 30 minutes, while the group work on getting Dane back in prison again. Only, there's a problem. The Dane catches wind that they're about to double-cross him and he hightails it away after leaving a message on the mirror for them reading, You changed the deal. Barry trying to calm his nerves, which is made worse when Tina reveals exactly what's happened with the Dane running away. Not only do they need to get the truck back, they also need to find the Dane now, too, otherwise Barry could be in a world of trouble. Alden and Rue work on trying to find out where he is, but he's actually back at headquarters. Dane actually wants to go back to prison, realizing that this is what's best for his children. He doesn't want to be on the run for the rest of his life. With inspections beginning, it's touch and go before they can make the switch. While this is going on, Luke and Emma work together to get the gear back from the thieves whom they find in a warehouse, armed and dangerous. They both realize that they need to prove the Great Dane is definitely part of this meet, and at this point, unaware that the Dane is back, decide to use a wounded guard who looks exactly like him to be their ticket. Boro shows up with the fake Dane, but the former soon realizes that this is all a setup and rushes away across the landscape, especially when he notices the guy bleeding. As they give chase, Boro eventually passes out thanks to being shot with a tranquilizer. They could keep him indefinitely if that's what it calls for, and they know that he has ties to various different terrorist organizations across the globe and could help unlock all of this and do great work. When Emma and Luke head in to question Boro, our antagonist comes up with an ulterior plan. He wants a house arrest order in Bora Bora, complete with a waterproof ankle bracelet. It's still a prison, but a nice one. Should Luke and Emma refuse this offer, it would also mean they leave without the buyers either. In the meeting room, though, Boro points out that he communicates with his buyers via the dark web. They're pinged once he uploads an authentication video to confirm he has the bomb and it's operational. They have a state-sponsored satellite all ready to go to trace the bomb's unique signature, and once they sort everything, there will be ice cube emojis sent, and will ultimately open up a big list of all the potential buyers. In order to enact all of this, their video needs to be filmed in a warehouse way out of town and away from the base, so off they go to film this, at the warehouse, as a huge gunfight breaks out. Unfortunately, Boro manages to break out in the process, leading Luke with deciding to head back to his family instead, realizing that Romy needs him. It turns out Boro actually got captured on purpose, and all those nuclear IP addresses were spoofed by Kane. This was one big, elaborate ploy to derail them again and break Boro free too. Dot calls a meeting for everyone at work. The team are briefed on where they are right now. Dot believes that Boro is going to have his weapons ready for sale in 10 days or less. Their play, though, is a high-stakes card game occurring in the next couple of days. Boro's right-hand man, Kane, is going to be there. Kane is their target, and given all the phones are locked away during the game, it's the perfect opportunity to smuggle some operatives in and use planted mobiles to extract Kane's GPS data, which should, in theory, allow them to learn where he's been, and Boro's exact location, too. Given Kane knows some of the operatives, it limits those able to head in. This means it's Barry and Tina who need to head in. But without any experience, how are they going to do this? Well, it comes from a special AI algorithm, a planted card shuffler and special glasses. While Tina and Barry get set up for the big card game, 
they need to get rid of two players who would have been in their place to make all of this legit. And that comes from the married couple of the Biryukovs. At the game, Barry is tasked with posing as a Nigerian, while Tina is a suave French woman. Together, they drop off their phones and prepare for the game. However, Boro shows, and it changes the mission drastically, with Barry and Tina needing to kill our big boss. Well, they decide to poison Boro with a special alcoholic drink that'll kill him in 30 minutes, the same length of time they have until the data is extracted from the phones, so it's pretty touch and go. Everything is thrown into chaos when a Russian big boss called Volek arrives in the middle of the game, admitting that he has a mole planted within the CIA. This mole, codenamed Songbird, can help find out who Finn and Danielle really are. In exchange, Volek wants the auction cancelled and the nuclear weapons kept for himself. As they come to an agreement, there's chaos with the cards as a drink is spilled and it disrupts the shuffler which short circuits and leaves the CIA in the dark. The CIA obtained intelligence about Boro's whereabouts and issued an order to eliminate him. Luke had reservations about the decision to kill Boro. He had raised him and even supported his education, hoping that he would not follow in his father's footsteps. However, it seemed that Boro was destined to follow a similar path, which was difficult for Luke to accept. Finally, the CIA obtained information that Boro was hiding in an abandoned nuclear power plant in Sardovia. There, Boro coerced Dr. Novak into explaining the process of creating nuclear weapons from nuclear waste materials. However, once Novak's job was completed, Boro killed him. The CIA operatives, including Luke, Emma, Alden, and Rue, arrived in Sardovia disguised as cadavers in coffins. However, Rue had taken sleeping pills earlier which made her extremely dizzy upon awakening. They arranged for a car to transport their weapons to the nuclear reactor, where they planned to confront Boro. However, they were ambushed by Boro's men along the way. With their firepower, they managed to eliminate Boro's men by destroying their vehicles. Unfortunately, Alden was injured as he was shot in the shoulder, and Rue accidentally destroyed their own vehicle with a powerful weapon. Luke instructed Emma to accompany him into the factory while Rue stayed behind to take care of Alden in a tunnel. As Luke and Emma entered Boro's base, they confronted his men, including Kane and his minions. A fierce fight ensued, and Kane had the upper hand, but he made a crucial mistake. Luke caught a bomb thrown by Kane and hurled it back at him, trapping Kane in a room. The explosion resulted in the deaths of Kane and the other men, but it also created a barrier of fallen debris between Emma and Luke, cutting off their communication. If the rising heat from the explosion triggered the nuke to detonate, it would kill Luke, Emma, Alden, Rue, and Boro. We see Emma separated from her team. She finds herself in a dangerous situation facing Boro amidst a raging fire and the threatening presence of the suitcase nuke. Wounded and armed with a pipe, Boro reveals his knowledge of Emma's past and her personal connections, particularly her relationship with the violin. Recognizing the situation's urgency, Emma suggests an alliance with Boro to escape the looming danger posed by the nuke. She offers to let him go free in exchange for their survival, allowing them both to live. Emma realizes the strength of her father. Upon reaching the vents, Emma and Luke turn the tables on Boro and decide to leave him to his fate. The facility erupts in a massive explosion, signaling a successful mission. Emma and her father reconcile as she apologizes for her past mistakes. Meanwhile, Luke is guilty of Boro's fate, feeling he could have done more to save him. The story then takes us to the day of Tally's wedding to Donnie. Luke is shocked to discover the news. Despite his feelings, he chooses to be the bigger person and decides not to overshadow their special day. However, deep inside, he feels a sense of emptiness after losing Tally. The situation turns disastrous when armed guards arrive at the church, triggered by a car bombing. Chaos ensues as Emma, Barry, and Luke join forces to counter the gunmen, navigating through the crossfire. Boro surprising everyone at the church, holding Tally hostage at gunpoint. Through detailed research, he has uncovered Emma's identity using the bridesmaid list. However, Luke's quick thinking allows Tally to seize the opportunity, stabbing Boro in the leg with the medal. As Tally escapes, Emma and Luke kill Boro, with Rue putting the final headshot, declaring him dead. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. 
I always love hearing from my viewers, so feel free to leave a comment below with your thoughts on the video or any suggestions for future content. Once again, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video.